Hello and welcome to the Bridges Members Only Webinar. My name is Leona Hobbs and I will be the online moderator during today's webinar and will collect your questions throughout the presentation. If you haven't done so already, please note that should you wish to follow along with the presentation slides or wish to write in any questions regarding today's webinar, you must log in to the web portion of this meeting. This information was provided to you via the reminder email sent earlier this week. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. However, please feel free to write them in at any time to the moderator through the chat system you see on your screen. We will be compiling them throughout the presentation and we hope to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion of today's call. Please be sure to include your location in your question or comment. Finally, just to note that today's webinar will be recorded and to maintain audio integrity, participants will be muted. I would now like to introduce our host for today's webinar, Gina Bowen, ADP Canada's Director of Web Strategy. Thanks, Leona. Again, thanks to all of uh, the Bridge members for joining us online today. We are extremely excited to bring our Bridge members this exclusive online event and we hope to be able to do more like this in the future. I'd now like to introduce Jacqueline Delavante, a human resources consultant with over 15 years of experience in HR, consulting, and talent acquisition. Jacqueline provides strategic HR consulting for small and medium-sized businesses in both Canada and the U.S. Today, she'll be providing an overview of the termination process and best practices for HR and payroll professionals. Jacqueline, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Over to you. Thanks so much, Gina, and thank you to all the participants on the bridge on today's webinar. In today's webinar, we're going to be discussing some best practices for terminations, including the process prior to termination, in which we'll give you some insights as to why certain decisions are made behind the scene. We'll briefly discuss the various components that are part of a termination package. We'll cover some best practices for preparing for and conducting a termination, as well as some tips for reducing the organizational impact and the impact on payroll. And finally, other payroll considerations for administering the termination. For the purpose of our discussion today, I'm referring mainly to traditional employee-employer relationships and not other types of workforce categories, for example, independent contractors. There are various reasons which trigger a termination and can be either classified as voluntary or involuntary. They may include when an employee resigns or is deceased, they may have been working on a contract that was for a specific length of time, which has now come to an end. They may retire from the organization. And in the last decade or so, many organizations have faced restructuring, downsizing, layoffs, office closures, including bankruptcies. A termination may occur due to an individual not meeting performance expectations, and that can be with or without cause, or due to some type of misconduct, which generally involves cause. Prior to terminating with or without cause, an employer should always invest time and attention to the process prior to the termination. We're mainly focusing on involuntary terminations in today's webinar, and some critical best practices to consider are avoiding impulsive dismissals. All the terminations should, of employment should be planned in advance. Often I see cases in which managers fire employees on the spot out of frustration or anger, and those are typically the ones that are overturned in wrongful dismissal suits. All of the pertinent information should be gathered in advance, so you're going to want to take a look at things like the performance documentation, attendance records, any other documentation that will support the business case and present a defendable position for the employer. Relevant documents should be reviewed in advance, for example, the termination clauses in the employment contract, the collective bargaining agreement, the employee's length of service, any accrued unused vacation entitlements, any statutory entitlements, and also ensure that the termination doesn't violate any statutory protections, for example, human rights. A written notice of termination should be provided in every case in order to satisfy the statutory requirement to provide written notice. The letter should outline the reasons for the dismissal in a succinct manner. The employer must consider whether it's appropriate to offer a severance package. 
The structure and components of termination packages need to be considered. Employers are often encouraged to obtain legal advice as this may help reduce costs and prevent future litigation. The employer needs to fulfill their requirements based on statutory and common law. In Quebec, this is civil law. In most provinces, statute law requires the employer to provide the employee notice or pay in lieu of notice of termination. I do encourage you to ch check the precise details of your jurisdiction as it may also stipulate circumstances in which severance or retiring allowances, mass termination pay and continue of benefits, continuation of benefits are required. If a workplace is unionized, the collective bargaining agreement will outline the termination requirements. Severance packages are usually gratuitous payments that are based on the common law requirements and are offered in exchange for the execution of a release. Typically, common law requires reasonable notice of termination, which can be impacted by such factors as the employee's age at the time of termination, their education, length of service, also the seniority of their position within the organization, their skills, salary, and the current labor market conditions. So typically, how long will it take the employee to find a comparable new job? Yeah. It's not always necessary or desirable to terminate an employee immediately and provide pay in lieu of notice. Yeah. A preferable option may be to have the employer provide an employee working notice well, minute, I'll take so care their of employment that. will end at some future date. Also, salary continuation is when an employee doesn't come to work but continues to receive his or her regular salary and benefits for the duration of the reasonable notice period. Another possible component of a termination package is whether outplacement services will be offered to the employee. Typically, these include job search, vocational and financial counseling services, which are paid for by the employer usually. Successful termination meetings are carefully thought through beforehand. The termination should be held in a private office or a room where you won't be interrupted. There's some debate about which days not to terminate an employee. For example, people have said that Fridays are not a good day. You want to make sure that it's not a significant day like the person's birthday, an anniversary or a holiday. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard about the, t the, uh, the case in which the employer conducted uh, a termination of a mother who brought her child to work on Bring Your Child to Work Day, so the termination actually incurred in front of the child. So you want to be wise of making decisions around terminations to make sure that they're not any type of significant date or um, a significant um, day in the workplace. It's important that employers have all the termination paperwork ready for the meeting with the employee. The paperwork should include a termination letter, which will set out the package to be offered. And that typically includes a full and final release if that's applicable. You may have the ROE prepared. You may have the checks prepared. Uh, a termination works pay worksheet is often a nice thing to include, and that helps to um, uh, alleviate any questions that the employee may have about the calculations of the termination pay. And other attachments, which may include a copy of any originally signed agreements, um, like a proprietary or a confidentiality agreement. You might want to put in there a blank expense report or RSP contribution instruction forms, and you may include employment verification or reference letters. You want to ensure that only those who need to know of the termination are informed. Human resources is normally involved in termination activities from the start, and they may act as a witness in the actual termination meeting. Payroll may be informed in advance if, for example, you're terminating immediately and you may be asked to prepare a check or the record of employment so that um, that can be given to the employee the, day that, uh, the same day the termination is happening. Depending on the situation and the sensitive nature of the person being terminated, IT and facilities may be informed just minutes prior to uh, the termination to plan for deactivating systems and facility access during the termination meeting. Um, there was a high visibility termination that took place recently at um, the British head office of HMB 
the uh, about 190 employees were called in uh, to Human Resources uh, as part of a mass termination, and one of those individuals included the um, the corporate communications manager who was in charge of the company's Twitter account, um, and that individual proceeded to start tweeting live during the termination, uh, sending out tweets like, we're here live at HR where we're all being fired, exciting. Um, so obviously, um, you need to really take those types of things into consideration given sensitive, uh, the nature of sensi sensitivity of the nature of some positions. But either way, um, Anyone that you inform in advance of a termination should clearly understand the confidential nature of such information. News of an impending termination should never be leaked to the affected employee or any other employees in the organization uh, prior to the termination taking place. In some cases, you may want to prepare a script that you could use when dealing with the situation, particularly if you're new to that type of difficult activity. You'll want to think about creating a communication plan in advance, especially for terminations of high-profile employees. Um, employers should cover off how the termination will be announced internally and externally, and if applicable, in the media. Um, either way, you do not want to announce the departure of the employee, either internally or internally, until the employee has been informed. Termination letter should outline the reasons for the dismissal in a succinct manner. If the termination is for cause, it should clearly indicate and outline the grounds for dismissal. If cause is not alleged in the termination letter, the employer will have great difficulty relying on cause allegations later on in the process. It should also inform the employee as to the payment of monies owed to the employee up to and including the date of the termination. If no monies are owed, it should be indicated as well in the letter. So, for example, if it's a termination with cause or a termination during the probationary period, there may be no other monies following. In addition, it should outline any continuation of benefits and any conversion privileges of those benefits. The employee should also be informed as to the date when the benefits will terminate. You may wish to include some instructions about any outstanding business expenses, um, the return of company property, and a reminder of any previously signed agreements uh, that the individual is still bound to, like confidentiality or NDA agreements. If a severance is being offered, the reference um, you should reference the release and the terms and conditions should be clearly outlined in the termination letter. Indicate who they should contact with questions and their contact information. The termination meeting is definitely the most difficult aspect of the whole process. Nobody likes to do it, and in all likelihood, the employee will be upset. So however you handle it, if you handle it professionally and sensitively, the termination meeting can be completed without increasing any future risk of repercussions for yourself or your organization. Some key points to be considered in conducting the termination meeting are that the interview itself should be brief and it shouldn't last for more than 10 to 15 minutes. It should be concise and to the point. It should advise them of the decision to sever his or her employment, when the termination will come into effect. And don't allow the person to engage you in detailed discussions of performance issues or problems they've had or who's to blame. You'll want to review the details of the termination letter with the employee and provide them with a copy of the letter. The details are usually set out in the letter to the employee, so you don't have to go into a lot of detail, as you will be giving them a copy so they can go back and refer to it afterwards. But please ensure that you avoid in interruptions during the termination meeting, so turn off your cell phone or your desk phone if need be. If you're including a severance in exchange for an executed release, don't let the employee sign the release at the termination meeting. This should be allowed a few days to consider a termination package as that gives the employee an opportunity to review the package with his or her lawyer and or financial advisor if they, were, if they wish to do so. If applicable, you should discuss the return of any property which the employee might have belonging to the organization, what tasks, if any, need to be completed before the person leaves, and when are they expected to leave the workplace. Avoid getting into any confrontation with the employee and remain composed and professional throughout the meeting. 
If the employee is too upset to continue, you might wish to conclude the meeting. It is advisable to have two members of the management team at the termination meeting. So for instance, the employee's immediate supervisor and the human resources person. One person should take the lead in doing the talking. Typically, that's the person's immediate supervisor. And the other person, if that's HR, um, should take some care careful notes of what's occurring during the meeting. If there's a concern that the employee will respond poorly in the termination meeting, the employer may wish to have an outplacement counselor available. The counselor can be introduced to the employee at the end of the meeting and accompany the employee while he or she gathers their personal belongings um, to be there with them for support. If a collective agreement applies, the employer must be careful to abide by the terms of the collective agreement when carrying out any terminations of bargaining unit members. So this includes abiding by requirements for union representation, termination by seniority, or any super seniority provisions for union stewards. You should avoid supervising an employee's exit from the workplace unless there are compelling reasons to do so. Such reasons might be that you're concerned that the person might either deliberately or inadvertently remove some of the organization's property or cause a commotion when leaving. I think we can all remember the famous Jerry Maguire scene where he uh, was let go by his employer and decided to uh, cause, cause quite a commotion when he was leaving and decided that he would leave with um, not only a, another employee but also the fish. So. You might also be concerned that the employee will delete computer files if given the opportunity. You should allow the employee to return to her office to re retrieve their personal belongings if they wish to do so. Um, I, I recommend to give them that option. Um, so that can be done either immediately following the termination meeting in the presence of the outplacement counselor or with the HR manager. Um, don't have security staff accompany the employee as that would signal that the employee is untrustworthy and increase the risk of legal damages awarded if the court finds that your action was unnecessary. The employee should, however, be blocked from computer and system access. Alternatively, if the employer, um, if the employee wishes, the employer can arrange for a trusted manager or a human resources staff person to meet the employee after hours to collect their belongings. But whatever you do, you shouldn't force the employee to pack up their belongings in front of other staff members if they feel uncomfortable doing that or if they feel that might humiliate them. You want to exercise judgment on whether employees may say goodbye to their coworkers. Each termination is different, and I want to stress that employers should base their decision on the specific situation and the personalities involved. If the employee drives to work and, in your view, may be too upset to drive their car home, you'd be wise to pay for a taxi to take the person home and possibly for a return journey to pick up their car. Be prepared for anything. People's reactions to being terminated can run the full range of human feelings. You don't know what personal circumstances may affect their reaction, so a few tips for handling um, strong reactions include if you've taken the appropriate actions in reaching your decision, for example, if this is a performance issue, if you've been discussing the consequences of poor performance through the process with your employee, the termination sh decision shouldn't come as a complete surprise to the employee. But either way, you want to ensure that you're courteous, confident, and firm. If they ask what they can do to get the de decision reversed, inform them that the decision is final. Never argue with an employee to justify a termination decision. An individual may respond that the termination will cause hardship to themselves and their family. In, that, in the case of an employee terminated for poor performance, you may wish to point out that the employee really had ample warning, warning to try to improve their performance, or you can refer to any save, severance payments that may be offered um, to help ease their transition. If the employee breaks down, for example, if they start crying in the meeting, Allow them ample time to recover. Offer them a tissue or a glass of water and acknowledge that you know how difficult it is for them, but don't apologize for what's happening. If an employee shouts or swears, never rep respond in kind. Please stay calm and be professional at all times. If a terminated employee threatens legal action, you should either not respond or make a neutral comment such as, you are of course free to consult an advisor or a lawyer if you wish. 
The loss of a team member, especially if the individual was well liked or respected by their peers, can have a devastating and sometimes debilitating effect. To reduce the organizational impact of a termination, you should consider announcing the departure. Keep it simple and brief. Be prepared to inform those impacted by the employee's departure, such as immediate coworkers or subordinates, and perhaps even external contacts. Tell them that the employee no longer works for the organization and how his or her duties and responsibilities will be carried out in the future. Meet with remaining team members, both individually and as a group, to draw out their concerns. You'll want to clarify the implications for the team on a temporary or permanent basis with respect to the workload. It's useful to give some thought to what kinds of questions might be going through the minds of the remaining team members. And don't underestimate the power of relationships among your staff. The terminated employee will very likely talk to some of the workmates about the situation, so showing compassion and empathy will go a long way towards maintaining a good relationship with not only the departing employee but with the remaining staff. Be very careful about saying anything that could be perceived as an attempt to disrupt the personal relationships that exist between the existing team members and the terminated employee. It's inappropriate to imply that current employees should refrain from continuing their personal relationships with the individual. Give direction to the team members as how to respond to inquiries regarding the terminated employee and be sensitive to any unusual patterns or trends in absenteeism, productivity, or the general work atmosphere. <clears throat> when possible, provide advance notice of the termination to payroll, especially if there's not going to be any working notice provided. Um, this will allow enough time to prepare checks and ROEs if they're needed the same day. Be mindful of payroll cutoff dates when choosing a termination date. Terminations done after payroll cutoff may result in overpayment if, the call, if a recall isn't planned for. Um, having started my career in payroll, I can tell you that it's um, quite, quite the extra work to have to um, try to uh, recover overpayments af after termination is done after your recall point. Provide enough information so that payroll can process the termination according to the components of the termination package. So for example, if there's a pay, if there is pay in lieu of notice being provided, unused vacation, including vacation through the notice period, there might be a salary continuance. Um, the severance, you might have to apply lump sum tax rates if that's applicable. They might be transferring money to an RSP and there are tax implications associated with that. Also, there are benefit deductions that come through payroll. So, for example, the long-term disability is going to cont continue through the notice period, um, or maybe perhaps it's going to continue right through the severance period as well. And there might be mitigating damages. So if a severance package is structured such that if an employee finds a job uh, between the end of the statutory notice period and the severance <coughs> period, but before the end of the common law notice period, they may be entitled to half of it or they may not be entitled to any, any more money. So really, it's really important that payroll is informed of the details of the termination package because they are the people who have to administer and ensure that those payments are paid out properly. Um, and ROEs need to be provided within the appropriate timelines and contain accurate information with respect to the termination. So I just wanted to speak a little bit more about the records of employment and some of the blocks on the ROE that specifically have to do with terminations. Um, you have to be accurate in completing termination information in an ROE because um, sometimes in wrongful dismissal cases, a record of employment can be used as evidence um, in those um, cases. And if it doesn't correspond with the true circumstances of the termination, um, that can increase liability for the employer. So block 11 is the last day for which paid. This date usually coincides with the last day of work. However, in some cases, employees continue to receive insurable earnings even after their last day of work, for example, in a salary continuance. And in a salary continuance in particular, there actually is no interruption of earnings between the last day worked and the beginning of the salary continuance. So you wouldn't, in that case, issue a record of employment until the end of the salary continuance period. And in block 11, you would enter the last day as the salary continuance period, not the last day worked. Block 16 
Um, that's where you enter the code that best corresponds to the reason why you're issuing the record of employment. Involuntary terminations typically would use shortage of work, which is code A, or dismissal, which is code M. Um, when an employer initiates a separation from employment for any reason other than layoff or mandatory retirement, you would use code M. That is that the employee is leaving the workplace because he or she has been dismissed by the employer. You'd also use that code when the employee is terminated within a probationary period because the employee wasn't well suited for the position. And if you're using a, a paper ROE, uh, you'll want to put a comment in block 18, terminated within the probationary period. I also encourage you to fill out the contact information of block 16, um, and that's the person to contact for more information on uh, issuing the record of employment. If this is an HR person, you should fill in their contact information. Otherwise, they're going to be calling you as the signer and issuer of the ROE. So again, if you're having questions about what code you should be using in the record of employment uh, for Block 16, and I know that we had a poll question on the bridge uh, in advance of today's webinar um, that uh, we were asking people if someone is uh, dismissed for performance reasons, what code would you use? Um, and the correct answer on that was uh, code M uh, for dismissal. I know some people hesitate to put the accurate information in this block because they feel that uh, what they put in there may make the person ineligible from claiming EI benefits if they apply for them. Um, and I can say that those decisions are made by the EI office on a case-by-case -case basis. So using a code M doesn't automatically disqualify everyone um, from claiming EI benefits. As I said, that is um, uh, determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Block 17 is, um, refers to separation payments on the record of employment. 17A is where you would enter any vacation pay that the employer has paid or will pay to the employee because of the separation. Um, in Block 17B, you report the amount you paid or will pay for each statutory holiday that falls after the date. And in Block 17C, this is where you would break out any other payments or benefits that the employer has paid or will pay to the employee because of the termination. So if there is a pay in lieu of notice or a retiring allowance or a severance payment, you'll want to ensure that you capture that specific amount and indicate what it is. Um, you're going to, even if there's a, say, a bonus for a stay or a retention bonus or a closure or loyalty or separation or retirement type bonuses, you'll indicate that as there as well. There may be some profit sharing or settlement pay. And just a note about the settlement pay, um, as well as any gratuitous payments in exchange for a release. If those monies are paid out after the original record of employment was issued, you do have to issue an amended record of employment and capture that additional information that has been paid out after the first ROE was issued. So, and finally in block 18 in the comments section, um, really it's not necessary to reiterate information you've already provided on the record of employment form, and you would specifically put something in there that was asked for. For example, the um, example I gave you earlier with respect to terminating during the probationary period. So successful termination meetings are carefully thought through beforehand. You could consider a termination meeting successful if the employee understands the essential information about his or her status, you've treated the person fairly and with respect, and the organization has fulfilled its legal and ethical responsibilities, and the disruption to other employees is middle, minimal. The way an employee is treated on exit will be one of the last interactions they have with an organization, so it should always be handled professionally and with respect to pr preserve the individual's dignity. So I just, I had mentioned that one of the things you might want to do to um, help you prepare for a termination meeting is to um, uh, create a script for termination. Um, and that could be used by a hiring manager if 
if it helps them to feel less anxious about the meeting um, or if they're new to that type of activity. So if anyone is interested in um, having a, some type of script um, for themselves for reference, um, you're certainly welcome to contact me via email and I'd be happy to provide that to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. That was fantastic. And we have uh, some great questions from our members. So I am going to uh, start with the first question from Jan Murin. And the question is, what is mass termination pay? Hi, Jan. Thanks for your question. Um, in in the various provinces, uh, mass termination pay is typically something that occurs when there is a, uh, there's a threshold for the number of employees who are being let go at one time within an organization. Um, so I would uh, that and typically there is some requirement to pay out monies um, if you are experienced that type of situation. So I would caution. Um, each person to look at their particular um, jurisdiction statutory legislation with respect to mass termination pay because I believe that there may be some different nuances from province to province. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mei Ling and it is, are job search expenses paid by the company a taxable benefit? That's a good question. I probably have to go offline to take a look at that, um, but I will certainly be able to provide that information for you after our call today. Okay, very good. Uh, the next question comes from Brenda McLean, and it's a several part question. So when you're processing a salary continuance that flows into a different year, what is the best way to treat the source deduction? And her example is uh, EHT does not apply in the second year. How can we set up this start to stop period to avoid overpayment? Is that a bit of a technical? I think that's probably more of a technical procedure and I'm sure that ADP would be able to advise you in terms of um, their payroll services that they are providing you with respect to the best way to set that up so that you don't experience um, an overpayment to the EHT when salary continuance over more than one year is, is the circumstance. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the next question is from Brenda and it is an employee received working notice. When can this employee accept another position and still receive their full severance without penalty? So again, I'm going to caution you to um, take a look at the statutory uh, requirements with respect to um, resigning from employment after you've received your notice of termination because again, that is going to uh, differ probably from province to province, so um, I think it's best to probably take a look at your province's actual requirements with respect to that. Okay. Uh, we have lots of great questions. Okay. Everybody's yeah. really interested. So uh, the next question is from Jan Mirren, and the question is, do you have to tell an employee why you're dismissing them if after the probation period? Can you say it's a business decision? as long as you're giving them severance as per minimum provincial laws? Yeah, you know, that's a great question and, and I think that's something that a lot of employers struggle with, you know, whether or not they have to actually state the reason for the termination in the meeting and opinions vary on whether or not they should discuss that um, where there's no just cause being cited. Some employers simply uh, prefer to advise the employee that the dismissal is for business reasons and not to go into specific details. But that other employees feel, employers feel that it's their duty to state um, the general reasons for the dismissal, so whether the decision is for economic reasons or performance reasons. But if the termination is performance related, although not for just cause, um, you should always refer to the work-related behavioral aspects aspects of their performance that led to the decision. Um, so you may wish to cite, um, you know, a performance improvement and plan that was in place and the date of that. Um, but where the dismissal is for just cause, um, you are obligated to inform the employee of the nature of the misconduct or the performance deficiencies that are being relied on. And the employer should also make it clear that there will not be any notice or severance in, in, cer in those circumstances. Okay, thanks. So the next question, I'm not sure if it's Jean or Jean, 
but the question is, does it matter if you use the term severance versus retiring allowance for severance that is either statutory or statutory plus discretionary? Okay, and that is a great question because I actually had to call um, Service Canada um, to find out and they referred me to call Revenue Canada. And um, they, on, their, on the Revenue Canada website, there, and there's a link that we can provide you, it does have the particulars in terms of what um, different things are considered severance versus retiring allowance. So I think that's a, that's a great question and I think we should be able to provide the link to people that will um, spell that out in detail. Perfect. Uh, so from Lana in BC, she says, I'm wondering how to find out if benefits continuation is required through the pay in lieu of notice period. Yeah, and in, spe in specific provinces it is generally uh, required through the pay in lieu of no notice period. There is some case law um, on the books right now, for example, in the province of Ontario, where uh, the continua continuation of benefits um, have, uh, uh, judges have been sort of saying that they should be continuing right through the, the common law notice period of well, as well. So um, again, it really depends on your particular province, but um, in most jurisdictions, it definitely does require for the benefits to be continued during the pay in lieu of notice period. I also want to mention that it's not just the benefits and their regular salary during the pay in lieu of notice period. Typically, it's any t anything that's of a cash uh, or monetary value that that employee was receiving. So if they were getting a car allowance, they should get that through the notice period. If they were receiving you know, a club membership, they should get that as well. If they were receiving a tuition um, a bonus or something like that through the period, anything of a monetary value they were receiving should continue through the pay in lieu of notice period. And again, you can refer to the specifics in your statutory uh, province's legislation. Thanks. Uh, so the next question is from Hamlin uh, in Toronto. And what happens if an employee still has not signed the severance letter and payroll has to proceed? Well, typically, when there is a, a severance, uh, which is the gratuitous payment that's being offered, um, in a termination, there's usually a time frame that, or a deadline for the employee to respond. If they haven't responded, then you, payroll normally doesn't pay out any of the additional monies above and beyond what's required in the termination of notice. So you would typically then just wait or that you're on hold until such time that um, the employee's lawyer may bring um, a, state, a statement um, against the employer and typically that's then handled through the, uh, the employer's uh, legal or HR and then they would advise uh, payroll once uh, some settlement or uh, ha has happened, uh, what the payout would be to payroll then. But in the absence of hearing anything from the employee, you don't pay out the severance uh, the gratuitous payment package part piece. Okay, so here's an interesting question from Lana. Uh, what code would you put in the ROE when you lay off an employee and give them the four weeks working notice and then they decide to quit and not work for that four week period? Okay, I would probably caution you to call Service Canada about that question because obviously uh, a layoff you would use code A and for quit you would use code E and I know that when an employee actually quits um, that may make them in ineligible for receiving um, insur unemployment insurance benefits in some cases. So um, I think it's important to speak to uh, a person at Service Canada and explain really the specifics around your um, your certain circumstances there so that they can really give you an accurate um, answer to that question. Thanks, that's interesting. I bet that's, I bet that that's not that uncommon, right? People, yeah. 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 Uh, so this question is from Marcel. What if an employee negotiates that payroll continue to pay out the severance in lieu of biweekly segments just as if, just as if they were at work? Does this not cause an issue? So sorry, instead of getting a lump sum uh, payout that the employee requests 
request that it be uh, structured as a salary continuance, if I'm understanding the correct yeah, question. Yeah, sounds that way. And does that cause a, uh, an issue for payroll? Yeah. Okay. So I think if that is if that's um, how I'm understanding your question correctly, um, basically um, sometimes that does happen that they're asked to um, go instead of doing a lump sum payment um, that they would go through salary continuance. So in which case um, that probably makes things a little bit easier for payroll because you continue to just receive the pay as per normal until the end of the severance period, at which time you would just um, cut the person off from payroll and um, you would put the appropriate code um, on the record of employment at that time and you would use the last um, date work as the, the day um, which corresponds with the end of the salary, salary continuance period. Okay, we're just recording some of the questions here. We've got lots. Oh, um, here's another question. Uh, what is the best time of day to conduct a termination? Okay, that's a good question. So it's recommended um, that the meeting uh, should take place at the beginning of the workday. If you if you do this, the person won't later resent that they had to work the whole day um, to end their final day, and possibly interact with maybe other people in the workplace that might happen to know that they're about to be terminated, including the manager. Um, so secondly, it makes it easier for the person who has to deliver the bad news. Um, people also tend to be less tired in the morning and better able to cope with stress. So if an employee is dismissed at the end of a tiring day, the situation can become more unpleasant and unpredictable. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's another one from Kim. Is a termination letter important when the employee is still on probation? You still do need to provide a, a, a termination letter to the employee and I think as I mentioned earlier, you'll want to state specifically if your, le if your um, statutory legislation uh, indicates that there is no termination of notice uh, required during the probationary period that no other monies will be paid out, that you give them a letter of termination indicating the day that their termination is happening, uh, which is usually the day you're having the meeting with them, and to let them know that because it's during the probationary period, no further monies are being paid out if that's how your um, provincial jurisdiction lays it out. Okay, here's another question. Are there any advantages to providing a salary continuance? Um, yeah, the benefit to an employer in terms of structuring a payout of a salary continuance is that the cost of the termination can be spread over several weeks or months compared to having to pay an upfront lump sum payment. Um, so salary continuances of um, t continuance terminations are usually quite common, especially if, there's a, if it's a longer term employee with a long notice period. So if it's somebody who's worked for your organization for, you know, three decades or something like that and, and typically the payment is maybe a year or two years or beyond that, you know, um, certainly a salary continuance I think ha has its benefits to an organization to spread those costs over a longer period of time. Okay, so this one, this question actually relates back to uh, something that we might have been discussing before. If you know a bonus will be paid out at a later date after the termination, but you don't know the amount, should you include this information in comments or just wait until the bonus is paid out and issue the ROA, ROE and amend it? And that's also by Jean. Yeah, Jean, I would recommend that you just wait until the bonus is paid out and then you would issue an amended record of employment to indicate in block 17 um, that bonus payment amount. Um, um, Service Canada has recently changed the way that they're um, processing their records of employment. So if you write anything in, those, in that block um, 18, which is the comments section, it usually uh, pops them sort of out of the automated queue for processing their EI benefits and it can cause a delay uh, in them receiving those EI benefits. So I caution you not to put anything in the block um, 18 under the comments section unless specifically required to do so um, from the instructions um, on the block by block instruction page for the record of employment. Uh, okay, uh, I'm just getting the next question. Sure. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> Great. It's Leona. Sorry, just jumping in here with the next question. 
um, from Karima. Is an employee entitled for vacation while on short-term disability, according to Ontario law? So my understanding is, is if the employee is currently on short-term disability and they're being terminated during the short-term disability period, they would be entitled to any of the statutory requirements of termination um, in Ontario. So I can say that in Ontario, yes, that regardless of whether you're actively at work or if you are on short-term disability and you are receiving um, short-term disability pay, because that's usually through the employer's payroll in, most, in, in some cases, that they would be entitled to um, the, 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 um, the pay as you had asked. Uh, next question is from Natalie. If you terminate an employee at the beginning of the day or midday, what are you obliged to pay the employee for the day of termination? You have to pay them for the full day. Great. Uh, from Lindsay, do you still tax the salary continuance with the rate of the entire lump sum amount? Okay, so you'll want to t you probably should refer to um, the Revenue Canada guidelines on that um, because it depends on um, there can sometimes be various components of the severance package. So you really should uh, pay careful attention um, to what Revenue Canada indicates which por portions of monies in a severance uh, are allowed to use lump sum tax rates. Okay. And a question from Kristen, sort of getting technical here. If an employee is on maternity leave and their job is still available to them if they choose to return, but if they choose not to return, would we offer them a salary continuance as per their contract? If they chose the salary continuance, would this be considered a settlement or severance on their ROE? Okay, so I'm... I'm trying to understand if uh, if an employee is currently on maternity leave, their job is available to them when they return um, from their maternity leave. Their employment contract stipulates some type of severance payout um, upon termination. This is a pre-negotiated in their employment contract, which is uh, negotiated and signed prior to them actually starting work. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, terms, as I said, to refer to the uh, employment contract with respect to any clauses around the termination and monies owed at that time. Um, if the employee, um, you know, it, some employers do negotiate um, if the employee doesn't wish to return, um, that that is, uh, a, a par they'll consider that, um, you know, and abide by the the termination clauses and in other cases it could be that the employer wishes to uh, take the position that that employee is, is, is resigning. So it really is a unique uh, and individual situation so I think that it's important to um, get your HR involved or your legal involved if you have to with respect to those termination clauses in an employment contract. Um, we just had one follow-up from Marcel. Um, sorry, every time someone writes a new question, I, my screen changes. In addition to my last question regarding where the employee requests that their lieu and severance continue on a biweekly basis, her company requires to, them to put the original term date, but from your answer, it seems we are correct in putting the end date of the salary continuous, continuous. Does she have that correct? The, from the information that I looked up on um, Service Canada's website in terms of filling out um, the, the block um, uh, where you indicate the last day for which um, um, worked, it, you would indeed put the last day of the salary continuance and not the physical day, last day that the person was at work. But you can you can certainly wish to refer to that information, and that's on the um, Service Canada website, um, where there are the block by block instructions for completing the record of employment um, on their site. Okay, so I have two more questions. The first is from May in Calgary. I hope May is 
dry and warm today. If an employee chooses to go with salary continuance rather than lump sum pay, are employers required to continue benefits as technically they are still in payroll? Um, that's a good question, and again, I'm going to defer you to um, refer to your specific jurisdiction's legislation. Um, in some cases, um, salary continuances come about because of, uh, um, you know, uh, this, this is an arrangement that they have agreed upon um, prior to it going to court or something like that, and uh, those minutes of settlement will specifically indicate um, what may or may not continue during the severance period. So uh, I've seen some in, in that um, the benefits have continued like normal. I've seen others where um, between the two parties they've agreed that the employee would be paid out any pay and uh, accrued vacation pay up till the date of the termination um, and they would not con accrue vacation pay during the severance period. So um, really it's going to be uh, on an individual basis uh, depending on the circumstances um, that may be uh, agreed upon. Okay. Uh, and May says, uh, yes, they are safe and dry and kudos to everybody who is helping out in Calgary. Yeah. Um, a question by someone who prefers to remain anonymous. Um, a scenario here, the employee hasn't signed a severance letter okay. and did not sue. Okay. They called the company more than two years after the fact. Okay. Do, does that company have to pay them the originally offered severance? Okay. And again, there are going to be uh, legislative requirements in each province for how long an employee could file, let's say, um, a claim for example, through human rights or um, through the their um, province's Employment Standards Act. Um, typically, I advise most employers to ensure that they keep their records for at least a two-year period um, in terms of any terminations or any notes or any um, evidence with respect to termination for a two-year period. So, and in those cases where someone contacts the employer um, after a two-year period, certainly advise you to get HR or get your legal involved um, because um, that's going to be a, that's a very unique situation. So, um, there may or may not be uh, ongoing liability on the employer there. So, I think we have one more question, and we're just about at the top of the hour. So, uh, we're right on time. What happens if an employer misinforms an employee about their termination entitlement? That's a really good question. Um, so that can happen um, typically if, uh, if the employer, uh, let's say in the termination letter, they um, sell out what's involved in the ter what they're going to be receiving and then if there's some disconnect between the employer what's set out in the employment letter and what the employee receives through payroll administration um, that can cause um, some problems um, employers need to ensure that the information they provide to the employees for example any group benefit extensions or conversions or pension options or the actual amounts of accrued but unused vacation they have to ensure that those are accurate because not not doing so could resort in the court setting aside the agreement on the basis of misrepresentation. So if the employee signed off on a termination package based on incorrect information. So it's really important um, as payroll practitioners if you're asked to um, help calculate any payroll calculations to ensure that you are doing those correctly. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Well, thanks again to all of the uh, participants who have joined us today online and for all of your great questions. And a very, very special thank you to you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, for providing some great insight and advice and just rapid fire answering all these questions for us. Uh, to the folks on the phone, you'll be able to access a recording of this webinar uh, on the bridge within the next week or so. And we'll also post any relevant links and a copy of the PowerPoint slides uh, on the bridge as well. Uh, we'd, we'd like for your input on this webinar. so. Uh, please share your comments and suggestions on the bridge. Uh, there, I'll be posting a poll so you can rate the uh, event. Uh, the poll will be on the home page just in the same spot that you saw the, uh, the, the termination poll. So I welcome you and invite you to, uh, to, uh, to rate the event. 
And uh, thank you very, very much again for your time, and look forward to hearing you all join uh, the, our next event.